Hello and welcome to The Harbor View, the show where we check the pulse on what's going on in Hingham. We'll give you some quick updates and things to check out and then speak with our community guests. Today we'll be speaking with Kurt Gerald of The Anchor and John Lanham of Father Bills in Mainspring about their respective roles and what we can anticipate in the near future for the town of Hingham. Let's start with some headlines provided by our town leads as well as Harbor Media blogger Carol Meyer. After 31 years of dedicated service to the town of Hingham, Hingham Police Sergeant David Hort has retired. He was joined at his last roll call by family, friends, co-workers, and town officials. A retirement badge was presented by Chief of Police Glenn Olson. We wish you the best, Sergeant Hort. The April 22nd town meeting is fast approaching. Among the many warrant articles for voters to decide are eight related to Community Preservation Act proposals, ranging from affordable housing opportunities to improvements to the Plymouth River School playground. CPA funding comes from a tax surcharge approved by Hingham voters in the early 2000s and may only be used for affordable housing, open space acquisition, historic preservation, and certain recreational projects. This year's proposals recommended by the Hingham Community Preservation Committee total $725 million. Town meeting has the final say. This year's proposals include $300,000 toward potential affordable housing opportunities, $29,921 to stabilize the Old Ordinary Museum and the annex at 21 Lincoln Street. $60,000 for the Rec Commission to conduct a comprehensive study of the town's athletic fields and tennis and basketball courts. $11,651 to restore the mechanisms of six bells in the Memorial Bell Tower. $120,000 for additional funding to complete the Bathing Beach, Bathhouse, Concession Stand. $24,445 to be used by the school committee to rehabilitate and restore the Plymouth River School Playground. $19,528 to continue restoration and conservation of veterans' markers and monuments in the Liberty Plain Cemetery. $50,000 for the CPC's administrative fund. The Hingham 4th of July Parade Committee sold this year's button at the Snap Pizza Palooza on March 27th at the high school cafeteria. Sophia Kondracki, a fifth grader from St. Paul's School, beautifully created a watercolor-like sunset over the world's end, depicting this year's theme, Celebrate Hingham's Natural Beauty. The buttons will soon be available at many local businesses for a donation to this year's 4th of July Parade. The parade, as you know, is held annually on the 4th of July at 10 a.m. on Main Street in downtown Hingham. All right, folks, tonight we're talking about a very important topic, addiction and recovery. And I'm here with Kurt Gerald, Executive Director of The Anchor. Nice to meet you. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. So I kind of want to dive right in. I mean, there's a, there's just a lot to talk about, and I kind of want to start with um, a little bit about the background behind the anchor and what the anchor is. All right. So um, first of all, thanks for having me on the Absolutely. show. Absolutely. Um, so I'd say a couple, several years ago, four or five years ago. So I'm a pastor in Hingham. Yeah. Uh, at North Street Community Church, um, and North Street Community Church. Uh, the head pastor is Jeremy Scott, and he, he along with the uh, the members of the congregation, were seeing this, uh, you know, what addiction was doing to Massachusetts, but also their surroundings, right? Their local community yeah. in Hingham, Hull, uh, Quincy, Weymouth, and uh, you know they would have some people walk in randomly and and uh, you know say, "I'll oh, talk about their family member might have just died," or. Um, and also, it's touched our congregation as well. There was a couple. There was a there was a, a death in the congregation due to substance use disorder, um, and and a couple people who actually struggled. So um, they saw it, and they wanted to do something, and they wanted to do more than just uh, as Jeremy says, do more than just offer uh, their thoughts and prayers. Right. So and condolences. And, and condolences. Cetera, yeah. Yes, they wanted to actually do something. Right. So they started formulating this stuff, started praying about it, started thinking about uh, what could be done. And they jumped out on a limb. They got this two year grant um, to hire a pastor to come up and start a ministry. Um, so I'm in I'm in ENC at the time. Uh, 
just about to graduate, no clue what I'm going to do with my life. Right. Uh, I knew I was going to be a pastor. I just didn't know where. I knew that I felt called to work with people uh, that struggle with substance use disorder and, and uh, you know, maybe live a criminal life and and uh, that type of stuff just due to my past. Right. Um, or just people that, you knew growing up. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's who I felt called to minister to. And so they... Um, I had heard about this. My professor Montag told me that, hey, that they're hiring this addiction pastor. And and to hear that is just like crazy to begin with because you never hear of such thing as yeah. called an addiction pastor. Although so, in some ways, I mean, a lot of people with addiction and, and issues like that have gone to the yeah. church for, for a for long help. time. Yeah. And Absolutely. to have a specialized pastor is pretty mm -hmm. cool. It is pretty neat. Um, so I heard about it. Um, I hunted Jeremy down. Um, and he actually, when I finally found him, he's like, oh, I, we offer the job to somebody. So I was upset, but yeah. then uh, something actually turned around. Uh, two weeks later, he called me, so the person turned it down, they called me uh, to come in for the interview. And then uh, we started there. It just started, moved me up to Hull, me and my wife. And then a month later, we had our son. And it all uh, started happening. It all started happening. So, yeah. you, so you kind of, you didn't get knocked down, but like, you mm -hmm. know, you went through the the first interview process or yeah. was looking at an opportunity, but you got back up and mm -hmm. knew what you wanted to do. And yeah, yeah. It all I, I was I was heartbroken at first, but yeah. then like uh, for me, and again, this is just speaking from from my own thoughts and beliefs. Like I was like, you know what? At least God's hearing me. You know, that's how I felt. I was like, He's hearing me. Uh, you know, I didn't get the job, but I know because that's what I was praying for, right? I was right. like, Yo, God, you know what I am. You know what I'm capable of you know what uh you know what my past is um and I, I just that's where i felt called to i didn't feel called to just be the normal right you know preach on a sunday type pastor so yeah the more specific passion than yeah that. yeah well that probably is what's you know driven you and yeah kept you going yeah absolutely so absolutely. so you were a pastor before you even got involved in all this so I, that's what I went to school for. Right. Um, and then I was doing my internship down in Taunton where I was living. Uh, I went through Street Baptist Church. And, and I would do similar stuff, right? I'd work with the homeless or right. uh, people who are experiencing homelessness and, um, you know, just try to build community with them and, and yeah. people struggling with addiction as well. So. so tell me about the journey. So when you got this opportunity mm -hmm. and you started getting involved in addiction specifically, tell me about that that road that you've been been on so far okay and kind of um, where we're at now with the anchor so i had no clue what i was doing yeah right? like uh they were they were kind of like all right you're here now go do something <laughs> make a right? program yeah, sort of pro yeah. and we we are we were intentional about it we wanted um they weren't hiring somebody to just go out and do everything right. they were hiring somebody to to kind of start something where the congregation themselves could get involved and serve and, and stuff like that because I mean, our congregation has been very um, uh, adamant about uh, serving and loving those in intangible ways. Like in the 80s, I believe it was the 80s, um, Friends of the Homeless came out of our church. And uh, now I don't know how many families they house a night, but they house, I think, 50 families a night, maybe. So it grew. Um, yeah, so it, it, our yeah. church has always been... Um, somebody who likes to get out there and do stuff, get their hands yeah. dirty, uh, hands dirty per se, I guess, you, you know. But, so I get there and um, I had no clue what I was doing. And um, I just kind of just started talking to people in Hall. I moved my whole family up there. I just started talking to people in Hall. That's where it started. Um, going on the Facebook pages, just- Social media probably yeah. now versus yeah. the 80s is like- yeah. Huge, and you yeah. probably get a lot of recruitment, so. Absolutely, and um, I found out about this uh, HAPSA group, which was, it's no longer in existence. It was the Hull Coalition um, for um, for Substance Use Disorder. Uh, they it's supposed to be like a bunch of town officials that come together and try to do something about it, um, but that is since, uh, disbanded but. so that was like a, a municipal or a government kind of organization yeah. handling it versus yes the it's but the, so it's 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 hard to explain like they weren't there as a town officials were a part of it but i don't believe it was it wasn't like funded it wasn't yeah so each town has it hingham has hingham cares i'm, I'm on the board right. of that um which actually that became a nonprofit uh recently but um so that's where I started, and I just started talking to people there and seeing how I can be 
uh, of help. And my first thought was, I need to get in with the police because right. that's they see it every day. So I made an appointment with Chief Dunn, um, went in there and told him, you know, I, I want to help. I want to be of service and uh, told him my background a bit and what, what I'm doing and what we're here for. Um, and it started from there. And then I got plugged in with uh, this group called PCO. Uh, it's Plymouth County Outreach and um, and another group called PARI. And so that's what happened. I started working with the police and just started on the ground, right? Going on overdose calls. Uh, so you just called them up? Uh, you emailed the police? Them. Yeah. Yeah, I just emailed And you were like, hey, like, yeah, this, is the, this is the story. This is what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And of course, they, like you said, I mean, you go to, I don't know about any town in America, but mm. you go to a lot of cities and places like that have this problem and they're going to be the first line that's going to- Oh, absolutely. Yeah. First responders, right? Exactly. So I, I um, started going out with Detective Dunn in, in Hull and, and in, in Hingham, it's Detective O'Shea. Great guy. They're both great guys. And um, we would, if a person would overdose, we would visit their house within uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, offer them services, offer them um, recovery coaching, recovery coaching. Um, a representative from Manit would come, uh, which is a, community, a health community center, and they would offer um, naloxone, Narcan. Yeah. And uh, so that's where it started, really. Um, and I can't say names on here, but like the first person I met, right? So there's a pier outside my front of my house, A Street Pier. And uh, we're jumping off it one day, and uh, this guy was clearly inebriated. Yeah. And uh, jumped off and, like, smashed his face. I know it was crazy, but he's sitting over there by himself drinking and stuff like that. So, of course, what am I, I'm going to go talk to the guy, right? Yeah. And uh, so I started talking with him and seeing what he's about. And, um, and that actually led to then more people that he knew that needed help. And it just... You know, then word spread and um, it just kind of goes from there, really. Yeah. You know, so that, that's how it, I guess we started. That's how it's it progressed. There was no rhyme or reason. It and just, then and then now, how are you guys, how are you guys organized now? Like okay. looking what, two, what, how, how many years, two years now? Two yeah, years actually, now? Yeah, about two years, almost two years. So we've come, we've come a long way. Right. Um, <laughs> in a short period of time. Uh, and minimal funding also. Yeah. We don't get any state funding, nothing. Everything we have is from uh, private donations pretty much. And it's dwindling at that, but sure. um, uh, God provides. So um, what happened was um, we kept, everyone we talked to, uh, there was this constant uh, uh, theme or, or constant, everyone would say, even the, the, especially the kids in the high school, like I got plugged in the high school, I work with the SAD students. Um, we work closely with them and, and, and help them, you know, with their programming and activities and stuff. Um, they would all say there's nothing to do in Hull. If you don't play sports and you don't, you're not in theater arts, there's nothing to do in Hull. So um, it just kept, you know, in my mind, I kept thinking we need a place for these, for these people. Like not only, you know, the anchor, it, it's not necessarily only to address addiction. Um, it's to build community to help, you know, anything to, to fill that void. Well, right? I was going to say, then the other question is, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a complicated one, but why do people get addicted? Addiction does not discriminate. Right. Um, it's a disease uh, or disorder. Actually, I prefer it's a disorder, substance use disorder. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It's, you know, proven through the brain, you know, uh, brain chemistry and all of that. I mean, you know, it's, there's no doubt in my mind there should be no argument that it's a disorder, but how do people start, right? So there's tons of stories, right? There's the kid who started just smoking weed with his friends on Friday night, right? Um, and then progresses. There's the um, person, there's the sports star, there's the football star Gets that injured. tours ACL, right? Yep. And uh, got on some perk sets because the doctors just uh, were mandy. I, I mean, yes, the doctors, we can say they're at fault, but it's not really their fault when um, you're in excruciating pain and you yeah. have an ACL tear. Or and something and like they're that. also um, they also used to be um, the hospital. And this is what I heard from some nurses. They would uh, be told they have to prescribe it because to get a positive review. Right. If a person leaves and says that their pain wasn't addressed, 
then the hospital looks bad. Right. So they would, it, it was like, it's, so I don't blame the doctors and stuff like that. Um, there's also, I mean, it's complicated because, you know, mm -hmm. and when someone's in a circumstance like that, you also don't know what's going on in their head. They might be extremely depressed yeah. that they're having to deal with the injury and they might, you know, be very desperate in other ways and yeah. use that as a way to escape. So it's not always just the chemical yeah. aspect. No. It's I, the, so, so this but is the, the truth. But it's complicated. Yeah, yes. the truth is the drugs and alcohol is not the problem. The drugs and alcohol is the solution to the problem. Right. So the problem is in here and in here, right? So that's what needs to be addressed. So something is missing and something's, something's not correct right here. So my solution when I first started using, right? So I felt, I felt a certain way and when I used, I felt whole. So that was my solution and then the solution started to, yeah, stopped working right. and actually became part of the problem. And then, right, So um, it's frustrating because yeah. you're not even getting that satisfaction yeah. anymore. Yeah, it's, yeah. So there's, it's endless the ways a person can get addicted, start to become addicted, right? It all, I mean, it is a brain. I look at it as a physical, spiritual, and uh, mental. Uh, the big question I think a lot of people have right mm -hmm. now, like when you turn on the TV or you like go on a news feed, is, is this problem getting worse? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are saying yes. They're saying, you know, we're having a huge opioid crisis. We're having a huge heroin problem mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, what... What do you, being on the front lines of this, mm. how do you feel like that's manifesting or why do you think that is? So, I don't know if it's getting worse. I think we're we're at a plateau right now. I, that's what I believe. Um, but, I mean, the deaths are definitely down. Um, and we can attribute it to all the services. And we can also attribute it to uh, the Narcan and Aloxone that's flooding the streets. Um, but <clears throat> deaths are definitely down. Overdoses are actually plateauing. Um, but it all start. I mean, it all started with the prescription, you know, uh, just dumping a prescription medication into the market in the nineties and early two thousands. You cre we created this mess, right? So you get a person hooked on painkillers and then a pill that costs $80 um, no longer works and you need to get two of them, right? 160 right. bucks. And then all of a sudden you're like, what am I? Then somebody says, there's a bag of dope for $10, a bag of heroin for $10 that does the same exact thing. What are you going to do? All right. You're going to go get the bag of heroin. And then you're and on then your you're, way. And then you're on your way. So this was created by the pharmaceutical companies. Right. You know, saying Oxycontin was not addictive. Right. You know, it's just crazy. And drugs have obviously, you know, been a problem for a long time. Yeah, in a lot of different places. Exactly. Yeah. But but that <laughs> aspect of it obviously changed a lot of things, at least in America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but what else? I mean, you, you do hear about it more, I feel like, in mm -hmm. the media now. And you hear more about politicians addressing it. Yeah. And there, there must be something behind well, that as well, too. Yeah. I mean, to be frank, and we were talking about it earlier, right? To be frank, it's because it's it's moved into Sally Mae's suburban home. Right. Um, this has been happening uh, forever. I mean, it, it, there's always been addiction. There's always been deaths. But um, now that it's happening in our own backyards. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Right. Um you know, and then politicians, you know, for good or for good or bad, um, they're running their campaigns off it, right? Sure. And uh, seeing it as a hot button topic, as gun control was, or whatever. Um, and you know, it is what it is. I'm grateful, right? Because we're finally getting the, the help that we need. Yeah. Right. Um, whereas when I first got sober, <laughs> there was none of this stuff. I mean. What was it, it was, like then? It, it was, was rough. It was, uh, you know, uh, go to rehab if you're lucky. Get Go to detox if you're lucky. Get a bed. Uh, rehab again if you're lucky. And then go to AA and that's it. But, that no, was, one's really, but no one's really talking. Like when that happened, yeah. you weren't hearing it on the campaign trail as much or no, anything like that no, or no. on the nightly news necessarily. No. And there weren't all these supports and services that we have today. Um, there's, I mean, literally, so my, the role that we've adopted, the recovery coach role, is literally a person who comes to you at the very beginning and walks with you through this journey, guides you, helps you, finds what you want to accomplish, and helps you overcome those barriers, right? So it's, it's about um, 
you know, it's not just about, you know, go to detox, go to AA. Because that, that doesn't work for everybody. So we're, we're killing, you know, that's why, uh, and, and listen, I love AA. I believe it's a great program. I think, I mean, it saved my life. Um, but it doesn't work for everybody. Right. I've, so, I've heard that. So um, there's so much more nowadays. Yeah. There's so much more help. And it's awesome. And I, and, and, it, it, and sometimes, like, it feel, feels like we're fighting an, uh, a losing war, right? A losing battle. And just constantly hearing, you know, my people dying or relapsing or getting arrested. And you're just like, oh, when is this going to end? But I have to believe that uh, we're making a dent. Uh, I have to. Otherwise, I would just quit. Well, I mean, it sounds like from the experience you mentioned, Mm -hmm. when when you were dealing with that or you knew people back in the day, let's say, that Mm -hmm. were dealing with it, it sounds like times have changed in terms of the amount of support, which is at least around uh, New England or South Shore. Yeah. Massachusetts yeah. is, is light years ahead of other states. I mean, they are, I mean, you know, I could sit here and bash the system and right. all of that. We are light years ahead of other. I mean, we are blessed with what we have here in Massachusetts compared to other states that are, you know, still locking up addicts, right? Locking up addicts as though the disease is a, uh, is a criminal offense. Yeah. So in the next six months to a year, let's say, mm-hmm. sounds like, there's a lot on your plate and there's a lot to do, obviously. Yeah. yeah. There's more to do. Yeah. Where do you guys see the anchor going? What are some of your goals? So now that we uh, finally have a building, um, uh, we're, we're going to be doing several things there. Um, so the first event is actually um, April, uh, April 27th uh, at from 6 to 10. It's going to be a Saturday night hanging out. So we're trying to transition and, and transition slowly into uh, introducing these, I don't want to call them programs or events. They're just like, um, like we're not a workshop. It's sort it's, of like, it's a, just going to be hangout. Literally hangout. we're going to open the doors and, and say, come chill. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like j- let's, let's, let's get to know each other. Let's hang out. Um, and then the goal is to have that every Saturday and then to open it up to every Friday and Saturday and then every, do you know what I'm saying? And slowly build off yeah. of that. Um, because again, this is what we want to offer this space to the people to, to, to give them somewhere to go um, and a, a, a way to build community, basically meet new people and, and build this fellowship, you know. Um, then April 28th, actually the next day is Anchor Day at my church from 1030. Uh, it starts at 1030. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, I'll, I'll do some speaking about what the anchor is. We'll have some testimonies about people who have... Um, you know, participated in the anchor and partnered with us. And I use the word partner because um, I don't like to. I don't like to say like, you know, if you say like I'm serving this person yeah. or I'm help, it's kind of like oh the great it's, I it's am. It's kind of condescending. Yeah, yeah. And where we're partnering, like I'm just your partner in right. this journey. Trying to help you yeah. walk. Yeah, we're gonna walk this together. Um, so though, you know, we'll have some of those people coming and saying talking about the anchor, and then um, we'll actually have the official grand opening May 18th. Congratulations. Uh, Yeah, thank you. It's pretty cool. Yeah, a ton of work. I mean, two years, I mean. Yeah. So the church is on 235 Main Street. It's um, uh, North Street Community Church. So that's April 28th. And then the um, address of our place is 7 Hadassah Way uh, in Hull. What is it again? 7 Hadassah Way. So, and this is all on the website you guys have, right? Um, The website is... And you got lots of brochures. Yes, too. I got brochures, and so the the website is www.theanchorofhull.org. <laughs> so it's theanchorofhull.org um, is the actual website. Right now, it's just kind of uh, it's not like the best website right now. We're working towards uh, having like a fully functioning uh, our own website right now. The website is kind of like when you type that in, it redirects you to our church website, but to our the anchor page with all this information. But we're uh, we will have the the website up and running within the next month. And um, if folks have questions or kind of so they yeah. can call me directly uh, at the anchor line at seven eight one five three four nine three two seven. Um, my wife and uh, and boss and everyone says i shouldn't answer the phone 24 7 right. but i do answer the phone 24 7 because you know this addiction isn't a nine to five thing yeah it, it, a person could be overdosing at three in the morning and needs help 
right? right. I'm going to answer that. And phone even call. if they don't call 911 and they call you, yeah. you're still responding. It's, it's actually, you know, it's changed. That's how it started, right? It was the police would ask me right. and I'd go out with them. And now it's like they're just calling me direct yeah. um, in Hull. So there's the website, there's the phone number they can call um, to find out all this stuff, or they can just stop by uh, when it's when the building's like officially open. And this is the kickoff, so this is when it's gonna get people, yeah. hopefully you guys are gonna get more people on board, Yeah. get more engagement. Yeah, it's and- crazy, because I mean, we didn't even open yet. I just put the sign up, and the first day we had the sign up, somebody walked in needed help. already asked a yeah. question, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there's a need, unfortunately, right? Like, I wish I could yeah. work myself out of a job, exactly. to be honest, but I, you know, I don't know if that's gonna happen. Why are you so, so. passionate about this kind of work? Um, well, my, me, myself, I, I have, uh, struggled with in the past and I, you know, I suffer from substance use disorder and, um, I have found peace and freedom from it. Yeah. Um, and you know, from years and years of struggling and hopelessness and despair and just, you know, when death doesn't seem like a bad option, that type yeah. of living, right. Uh, you just want to be free from that. I know that feeling I've lived it, in it for years. Um, and then I know this other side, right? This peace and freedom that you can have, right? Um, I, I, if I was to keep it, that would be selfish, right? right? And also I was taught in, in AA, like step 12, you got to give it away, right? So that's how I, I, I couldn't picture myself doing anything else. Um, do I make a lot of money? Absolutely not, but I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it because... Uh, I wouldn't be satisfied doing anything else, right? This is, um, somebody took the time, you know, to help save me. Um, And I was the person that all my people would, you know, I was the person that was supposed to be dead or locked up for life. That, I mean, that's not bragging, boasting. That's just a fact. Yeah. And, um, and there was some close people who never gave up on me. So I don't care if I have to revive a person a thousand and one times because they might get it on. I will never give up on anybody because there's people who didn't give up on me. And for me, right, like, um, I don't want to go, you know, start preaching. Here, no, that's but, fine. You know, like, um, for me, I'm called to live as Jesus did, right, or as God did. And, and he was with his people to the end and he gave his very life for his people right so i'm that's what i'm called to do i'm giving my life my my free time my um time i should be spending with my kid you know time i should be spending with my wife time time i should be relaxing right it's dedicated to serving those people partnering with those people who have who are experiencing that same hopelessness and despair that i lived for years. That's some powerful stuff. Yeah, hey, Kurt, thank you for coming on. Thank I hope you. a lot of people come out to these events. Absolutely. And thank connect you very with much. you guys. Thanks, man. Have a great night. You too. Tonight, we're talking about a very important and serious topic, which is poverty. And I'm here today with John Lana. Pleasure. Service Director for Father Bills in Main Spring. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. It. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. So um, I just want to really kind of just dive right in mm-hmm. and talk a little bit about the organization and kind of how long you guys have been around mm-hmm. um, and sort of what you guys do for those who don't know yeah. for homelessness. Yeah, so Father Bills in Main Springs, we're a nonprofit housing and emergency shelter organization, mm-hmm. um, mostly based on the South Shore of Massachusetts. Uh, we started a, as two separate companies in the early 80s, um, both in Quincy and in Brockton. There were local pastors and uh, local um, interfaith leaders who saw that there were people coming and sleeping on their church steps or people who were sleeping right outside their buildings. And they tried to help as much as they can with their local communities, but they just realized that they need a better response. They need a place, a shelter for people to go to. So in, in Quincy in 1985 and in Brockton in 1984, both programs opened up uh, uh, both Father Bill's Place in Quincy, which is the local shelter there, and then Main Spring House in Brockton. Uh, 
later than in 2007, both agencies merged. They recognized that they were both doing really good work on the South Shore. Kind of combined. And, yeah, and they wanted to take a more regional approach to addressing homeless issues. So uh, Main Spring House was doing family shelter and, and individual shelter and workforce programs really well. Uh, Father Bill's Place was doing housing programs really well along with individual shelter. And both programs wanted to get involved in each other's stuff. Yeah. And instead of competing with one another, they said, let's join together and really try to make this a, a stronger agency that can address things regionally because homelessness doesn't just live in one city or one town. It's a regional issue. And that probably kind of covers some of the gaps that do occur, I'm sure, with mm -hmm. homelessness where you have one town that's maybe improving or doing well and then another one, you know, there's more issues. So Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something that, you know, people often struggle when they hear about a homeless shelter in their community or a new housing project going in their agents in their community thinking that you know, this is going to bring more people to their community. This yeah. is going to bring more homeless issues. Um, when in reality, they're already there. You may just not be able to see them. Um, we track uh, at Father Bills and Main Spring. We, you know, collect information on the cities and towns people are coming from. And it's all across the South Shore. I mean, there isn't a single city or town uh, in Norfolk or Plymouth County that isn't represented with homeless individuals. Now, sometimes they are more based in where the services are available. If there's hospitals or shelters, that there right. may be a higher concentration there, but it's, it doesn't mean that those programs are bringing people there. These are people from those communities. Well, people always there. associate homelessness, I feel like, with, with kind of more urban areas. Mm -hmm. and, or, you know, even in, um, you know, like smaller towns, it, mm -hmm. it's always concentrated where, like you're saying, like the resources are. Yeah. Um, I mean, what is that? Is there a lot of truth to that or is it? I think, I mean, I think there's always some truth to it. And certainly in urban areas, there's a lot of services available sure. so that people are going to be able to get the services they need. But what we're seeing across the state and across the country is that suburban homelessness is growing faster right now than urban homelessness. Suburban homelessness. Yeah. And so what we're seeing is, and a lot of it has to do with the opioid epidemic. It has to do with increases in rent costs, but, and just the fact that um, jobs just aren't providing enough for people to afford rent anymore. So we're seeing a lot more people in towns like Plymouth and Wareham and more suburban areas just with growing homeless populations. And what we're trying to do is to get into those communities to talk with them about solutions that are hopefully going to impact that in a more more sustainable way. And that would be looking at housing options for them, not saying let's build another shelter in your community. Because once you build a shelter, it's kind of hard to close it. <laughs> and we would yeah. much rather say, let's build some housing, let's develop right. some places for people to live and look at getting those people who may be living on the street or living in seasonal shelters, getting them into a permanent place. So would you say these are areas that maybe aren't, I don't want to say have never had homeless problems or you know, concerns, but mm -hmm. areas that aren't traditionally associated with homelessness and it's they're now becoming. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's certainly places people don't think of when they think of homeless right. populations. Oftentimes they're there, but yeah. they might be, you know, Smaller. outside and yeah, or scattered around or couch hopping a lot, you know, yeah. moving around just in a very unstable housing situation, but they're not, um, they don't have a place of their own. They don't have their own key to their own apartment. Right. Um, and that's what we really want to try to get to. And what happens when a, a shelter moves into a community? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it, it's good at first because you get a lot of people that mm -hmm. have a place to go. Um, what, are there kind of negative sides to that as well too, in terms of kind of, you know, allowing people to get to a self-sufficient place or have a a place to live outside of that or um, it's a good question i mean i think cities and towns are really trying to trying to battle with what is the best response to homelessness in their yeah. communities um there have been other cities in massachusetts that have drastically reduced the number of shelter beds that they have to the point where they were just sleeping people on mats on the floor because they reduced them too far to the point where they couldn't meet the need of people. But they people still in the had, were taking people in, but they so. They still had right. a need, but they just weren't able to do it in a really intentional way. And so I think what we're often trying to look at are what are realistic solutions to trying to end homelessness. And it sounds like, it sounds like a really unachievable goal at times, but it really is critical to the mission of Father Bill's and Mainspring of, we believe that there are practical solutions to ending, ending homelessness. Now, there may always be someone who's displaced by a fire or out for a night or two that needs an emergency shelter placement. But, yeah. you know, we don't want shelters to be homes for people. We, we believe that there are ways and the way that people use, use shelters in the past. So there are creative ways that you guys, that Father Bills and mm -hmm. Mainspring are looking at that are different from the traditional approach of the shelter yeah. and, you know, are, are helping to, to end that and are helping to end that currently. You know, what are some, what are some uh, kind of newer ways that, Mm -hmm. The town should be looking at kind of 
dealing with that yeah. issue. So the big thing for us is there's two factors. One is uh, developing housing, obviously, so yeah. there's housing available, but we follow what's called the housing first model. So housing first essentially says that um, you need to look at the person who's in the most need in, in your shelter, yeah. who might be str struggling with the deepest addiction issues, the most significant mental health issues, whoever has the most barriers and is most likely gonna be in shelter the longest, take that person and put them in housing and then wrap around the services there. Because once they're in that apartment or they're in their place with a case manager and social supports around them, they're gonna be able to do a lot better. Yeah. It's a lot easier to work on your recovery or to be consistent with your mental health treatment if you have your own address and you have a place that you can keep your stuff in at night, a place that you can get a good night's sleep. It just makes a massive difference in their life. And right now as an agency, we operate about 520 units of housing under that model. So that's 520 formerly homeless individuals and families that are now housed permanently. Wow. They they can stay in those units for the rest of their life. It, they have subsidies that are federally funded, so it acts similar to a Section 8 or yeah. you know, an MRVP, but it's their housing. Now, we will absolutely work with them to become more self-sufficient, to move on from housing if that's possible, to try to place them in their own fair market rent apartment, and many of our people do, um, but it's their home. It's not It's not transitional, it's not temporary, yeah. it's theirs to keep. And that's federally funded, mm -hmm. that program you're describing? Yeah, it's a federally funded program, and it's something that um, Father Bills of Mainspring was starting in 2004 for when this was just becoming a new model. And yeah. it's now become a national model that HUD advocates that all their right. housing programs take on. So it's something that we're happy that we were sort of on the forefront in this region to be able to do it. And we're seeing a lot of other agencies see the benefits of this type of housing. Right, so they were inspired by it and they've taken that model mm -hmm. and sort of used it in other areas yeah. to, to deal with it as well too. Yeah. The other big piece for us is we, we try to operate our shelters, what we call a triage model. So it's similar to what um, you would hope to see in an emergency room in a hospital. So uh, hospitals are very good at deciding what services you need and at what point. When you come in, they're not treating every single problem you've ever had in your whole life, but they're saying, why did you come to the hospital today? Right. If it's because you have a fever and you need some medication or you, you know, sprained your ankle, we're going to treat that. Right. And then they move you on. And then you're and, moved on. And right? you're moved on to right. that next spot. Now, you might go to your doctor later. You might go to some other social support, but you're not in the hospital for that long. That's what we want our shelters to act like. We want to have staff who are able to meet someone as soon as they come into the door, work with them to say, why are you here? What brought you here? What can we do to get you out of here as soon as possible? So it's targeted. It's very targeted and it's very specific to the person's needs. So we might have a young adult who comes in because their you know, parents saw that uh, they were struggling with something and they felt like, okay, I can't have this person in my house anymore. We can say, like, can we talk with your parents? Can we mediate? Can we yeah. figure out if there's some supports we can put in place so you don't have to stay here at shelter? So it's smart solutions. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to trying to find really creative ways to move people on as soon as possible. And the traditional model is more, you know, I am homeless, I need mm -hmm. a home, so I'm coming to the shelter to live. Yeah, they first. had they acted yeah. sort of like warehouses. It was sort of, it was like, you know, big locations that could house 100 to 500 people. You know, it was just, you come when you need us and we'll provide a bed, a meal, you know, and a safe place to stay, which is absolutely needed yeah, and it's critical. But a lot of the services that were there were voluntary or they were, you know, why don't you come and talk with us when you're ready to move on and we'll help you look for housing as opposed to the day you come in, we want to start talking to you about how to get you out of here. Yeah. Now, it may still be a long road. Everyone's barriers are going to be different. So yeah. some people may take months to move out. But if we start day one, then we know, okay, what the plan is and how to move them on. And you mentioned you guys get, um, for your programs, some of it's um, funded through the government in mm -hmm. terms of the housing for yep. folks that are like the extreme cases you guys are trying to provide housing for. Mm -hmm. How do you guys interact with the state specifically? So the state provides funding both for some of our housing programs and our shelters. So okay. we have state contracts at both uh, Mainspring House and Father Bills. We also oper operate family shelters and mostly in Brockton, Stoughton and Middleborough. So those programs all receive state funding uh, to provide shelter. The, the challenge we have right now is that on our individual shelter side, we get funded for about 126 beds a night. Um, it's a nightly bed rate that covers about 60 to 70% of what a bed actually costs. Okay. Um, the struggle is we have right now we're averaging about 280 people a night. So not even 40% of the actual cost of just operating the shelter itself is covered by the state contract. And so much of the gap is made up by private donations, okay. other funding foundations. But we put 
a lot of money every year into just making sure we can keep the doors open to the shelter. Our our board and our our founders always said they wanted the shelters to to keep their doors open to anyone in need. So outside of hitting our fire code capacity, we don't turn people away. If you show up at our door, regardless of whether we've hit a budget number or whether we've hit, you know, uh, you know, our state contract says that we've hit this certain number, we're going to keep letting people in. Um, to make sure that they have a safe place to be because yeah. because we are that refuge. But we, we spend so much money each year just trying to keep that building open when if we were fully funded by either the state or other programs, we could use that money for more housing development and try to move people on quicker. Got it. So that's how you guys are functioning with the state mm-hmm. in terms of funding, but there's a lot of gaps there and issues mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, it's a very lean operation, it sounds like, to just stay yeah. open and... Um, some of that is sort of supplemented with private donations, which is very generous yeah, as well, too. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of like the region, what what do you see as sort of a trend, I guess, or you mentioned challenges. What do mm-hmm. you see as kind of challenges in general mm-hmm. in Massachusetts, in the South Shore, uh, in terms of homelessness? Is yeah. it on the rise? Is it, it why are people kind of finding themselves without a home? That's a, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, so a report actually came out today that says that Massachusetts ranks 10th in the state in terms of the number of homeless individuals and families, um, in terms of having the highest percentage per in the population country? in the country. The country yeah. um, part of that is because um, as as a state, we provide uh, family shelter to any family that shows up to a Department of Transitional Assistance office that is presenting as homelessness, the state will provide assistance to them. Most states don't have a mandate that if you're a family in need, you are guaranteed to have some type of assistance. Most states Um, don't have that. Most states do not. And so that's why in a lot of states, you see a lot of families, unfortunately, living outside. They just don't. Um, There's no... There's just either not enough support, not enough funding, or not enough willpower to to do that. Massachusetts is the only state that has that mandate. Um, The other place is New York City as a city. Um, So in Massachusetts, we have a high number of families that are in shelter, which is a burden to the state, but it also means those families aren't outside, which is the most important piece. Um, So that definitely impacts the numbers. What we're also seeing on the individual side is that the number of elders in our shelters is growing very rapidly. Uh, We served 250 elders age 60 and up between our two of our shelters last year. Why is it? I think a variety of reasons. Um, Certainly rent costs are going up. What we're seeing is a lot of our elders are coming in for the very first time, um, sometimes because their spouse passed away and they're not able to maintain the home that they had. So their lives essentially completely changed and they're not working, obviously, at that age. And yeah. Um, a lot of them are on fixed incomes as well. And as taxes go up or sure. fixed costs go up, I mean, it's just hard for them to hold on to what they have. We're also seeing a lot of rest homes that are closing. And those were places that people could go if they maybe didn't need nursing home level care, but needed a place to stay that had some support. Yeah. Those buildings are closing. So the shelters are that safety net for all the other systems of care that sometimes fail. Right. So, so like private sector, you mean like rest homes, like private sector Nursing homes, resting rest homes, yep. support yeah. groups, things like that. Places that people could go if they weren't able to maintain their own apartment, that maybe they could share a unit. But, but now just they've lost maybe that potentially. And right, they've lost that stock of housing um, support. And, and for, for what's really been difficult um, for us and the per- people coming in is that elders for us were all in you know many years ago were always people early sixties you know that you know maybe just starting to get on Medicare or Social yeah. Security that we could figure out supports sure. are. We're seeing people in their 70s and 80s come in now with the very first time being homeless. And that's jarring for them. That's tough. Yeah, I mean, they've got significant physical health issues. I mean, a shelter is just not the best environment for someone of that age. They also um, might not have that much time to sort of transition or segue. Right, right. And, and, and they're looking now at housing, you know, housing opportunities that might have a two or three year wait list. So for us, it's this new dynamic. Okay, how do we move people out as soon as possible um, while still making sure that it's available and for people that need it? So like, are those people prioritized? I mean, how does that function? I'm thinking someone who's like you're mentioning 82, mm-hmm. 83 that goes in there and like they're they're on a wait list. And yeah. They're maybe dealing with a health problem. and Yeah. So for us, um, I mean, if it's some of our housing that we're looking at, um, we've got our eligibility criteria that HUD kind of lays that out kind for of us might. that we'll look at. And certainly age is one of those factors sure. that we can consider. Versus maybe a 31-year-old or something with time to... 
Yeah, there's a variety of things that go yeah. into it. But what we try to do is it's not just our housing that we want to look at. We look at any opportunity. So we'll look at other, you know, community um, elder placements. We'll look at um, public housing for people. Uh, we'll look at just anything we can to, to try fill, to, to fill the gap. Fill it. And yeah. we'll say, like, do you have family that you could live yeah. with? Maybe we could connect with them and start to talk about what the supports are that you need. What so it's it extremely it's extremely personalized and tailored to mm -hmm. what's going on, and that's why it's effective, essentially. Yeah, I mean, we really feel like it's effective because we're able to say, what is the barrier that brought you here right. that we can hopefully try to alleviate? In the next, uh, you know, let's say like six months coming mm -hmm. up here, going into the summer and beyond, you know, what are some of the goals that you guys have specifically right now mm -hmm. in terms of organization? Yeah, the, the big piece for us is we're looking to develop what we're calling a housing resource center. So... Um, you know, we said the shelters are these warehouse models. The shelters are only funded to be open during the evening hours. They're not, we don't receive any funding to keep it open during the day. Interesting. Now the building is open during the day, but a lot of our guests leave in the morning. The ones who stay in often are there for appointments or they're seeing the nurse in our clinic or coming in for lunch, whatever it might be. But the services we have during the day are basically just staff running the building. It's not a lot of people that are there to really figure out how do we move you out of here? How do we get you out sooner? So what we want to develop is a housing resource center that is going to be more tailored again to what people need, but also hopefully pull in other community services from other vendors and agencies in the area to say, this is your one-stop shop. If you are needing fuel assistance, if you need to sign up for food stamps, if you just need to help with the apartment search, like we have people here who can help you do this. Because right now, everyone that comes to the shelter comes because they don't have any other options left. You know, people try everything they can to avoid having to go to a shelter. They'll stay yeah. with any friend, any family, whatever they can do. So by the time they come to us, they've exhausted all those other opportunities. Right. We'd love for them to come a month before that or two months or something when it's like, I may be kicked out of my apartment because I'm falling behind in my rent. Okay, if we know that a couple months ahead of time, we might be able to help you out with that or we at least can get you to the right agency. So if they that can feel help you like figure I'm out. exhausting all my options, mm -hmm. I don't, don't want to be in a shelter, you find that people are, are reaching out to you almost preemptively to to kind of get guidance and counseling on how do I, you know, if I yeah. come here, how do, you know, what's the plan? That, and that's what we hope. I mean, that's and what that's we great. really think it, and, yeah. uh, the Housing Resource resource Center can be is that place that you go to because you know that there's help here so you don't have to come to right. shelter. We would love for people to come in during the day, get the resources they need, and then leave. And exactly, not have to yeah. sleep there at night. They can come in for meals, come in to see a nurse, yeah. come in to get a haircut, whatever they need, yeah. but they they don't have to sleep there at night. And right. that's what we're really trying to avoid is having that them having to sleep there. Certainly it'll be available if they need it, but of course. how do we work with you before that time right. comes up? So that's our that's our goal over the next couple of years is to be able to try to develop a program like that. What uh, what events do you guys have coming up that you want folks to yeah. know about that are important? So um, our biggest event of the year comes up on July 30th. It's called Food Fest. Uh, it's a fantastic pro uh, fantastic event. It's right down in Hingham at the shipyard. Um, we partner with the shipyard and uh, Beer Works to have about 40 different restaurants, vendors, breweries, uh, vineyards that come in and just do a free tasting of all the cool. best food that they make. Yeah, it's it's a great event. Uh, about 800 people show up. Um, there's a great band, um, silent auction, you know, live yeah. auction, you know, all the sorts whole, of whole just, deal. just fun stuff to do. And it's a great location right on the water, you know, nice summer night. Um, it's just a, a great laid back event. Um, so it's July 30th. Um, if people are interested about it, they can check out our website to buy tickets. Yeah, what's the website? Uh, so the website is helpfbms.org. Um, so they can go there if they're interested in, in the event, but also if you're interested in donating, if you're interested in volunteering with us, um, we love having volunteers or people that can come in and help in different ways. So, so you guys are, so a lot of like staffing volunteers. Yeah, we, we get about 400 volunteers a year that oh do a variety gosh. of stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's it's incredibly helpful for us because it actually, it, it covers about a million dollars worth of in-kind support, both for the items they donate wow. and the work they do. It's tremendous because it's it's people bringing in meals for the shelters. It's people going to our family shelters to do you know birthday parties for the kids. It's people going to um, some of our, our houses that we have in the community to you know do landscaping or painting. Um, the Hingham uh, Women's Group, last week had a bunch of their kids come and make bag lunches for people at the shelter. So the community just gets right involved. The and community, it's it's yeah. a great way for the community to get involved. It's a great way for corporate foundations to be able to come in and, you know, have like a fun kind of like work, you know, event to try to do some team building. Yeah. Um, and just what it's great for us is it gives people a chance to get to know who we are as an agency and the people we serve. 
there's a lot of stigma and a lot of misunderstanding of who a homeless individual or family right, is. Sure. Um, and so for people to see them themselves is really helpful and impactful. It's great that they can serve a meal, you know, come, you know, provide, you know, bring some deodorant or underwear, or whatever it might be. To make that connection in person. But yeah, to make that connection and to realize how close people are to being in that same situation and to know that, you know, there are tangible things they can do to help with that. Right. So that, I mean, that's what we're really looking for. Excellent. And then yeah. that's a good a place to network in terms of making donations, things like yeah. that. And um, connecting with you guys if people want to help with funding. Absolutely, yeah. So the website has a ton of information. About that. Um, but yeah, on that. But certainly they can call our, our office. Um, so our main number is 508-427-6448. And they can call and talk to any of our staff about you know things that they'd like to help with, if there's donations. I mean, certain you know uh, funding is always helpful with that. But if they say, I have an idea, I wanna run this kind of event for this right. program, we can talk through, okay, how would that work? There's how different ways it? to help. It's a ton yeah. of ways to help. And we wanna figure out what way, what skills they have that they can bring to us. And so we actually have a volunteer in uh, at Father Bill's place right now who he had worked as a mentor for students at Boston College for many years. He had done corporate work, retired, and wanted to do similar things. And he called us up and said, hey, I wanna volunteer. You know, I wanna help you guys out. And so we had him come in. He was helping to do, to check people in at night. Um, but when we talked with him about his skill set, it was like, you could be doing so much more for our people. And so he's now doing resume building. He's doing job workshops. Oh, wow. He's how, yeah, job search so with he's people. He's like a real consultant, but he, he started out just like- He just wanted to- Yeah, you know, hands do, on deck helping. Exactly. And, and it's been a tremendous asset for us to have this you know person who's so skilled offering his services, one for free, but also just being able to come and partner with our guests to help them out. And so it's just been fantastic. And we've got- you know, hundreds of other examples of people that do similar things, but. That makes sense. Yeah. All right, well, hey, John, thank you for coming on. I appreciate on. it, thank you very much.